let's get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to another Tulsky Center uh, speaker uh, event. And um, we're very happy that today's topic is disability rights as human rights. Um, you know, making fun of the disabled is really not amusing to most of us, though some in high places seem to find it so. The mocking has disturbing echoes of Hitler's Germany. In 1939, he issued a decree authorizing the extermination of the mentally ill and the handicapped. It became a secret Nazi program, Operation T4. Present day mocking of the disabled and past extermination programs manifest not only extreme cruelty, but also the, the dehumanization of the disabled as subhuman, something the leadership of this country is fond of doing to various groups. But uh, the disabled are not exempt from it. And uh, you should know that that is a total affront to the human dignity guaranteed to us all by international human rights law. These attitudes are also, of course, counterfactual in the sense that some of our most talented uh, uh, fellow humans have been disabled. I'll just name a couple. How about Stephen Hawking? How about Helen Keller, who was both blind and deaf and uh, in a re law related uh, fact, you may be interested to know that she helped to found the ACLU. How about the virtuo virtuoso violinist and conductor, Itzhak Perlman? And hey, we even have a former president, FDR. Uh, who uh, I'm sure you know was disabled by polio. I've made my point, but um, you know, there are uh, historically and in the present day, of course, um, disabled people with a range of abilities um, that includes the very top abilities, the very highest abilities. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Uh, she is a professor at law. Uh, oh, might be nice if you had her name, uh, Arlene Cantor. And uh, she is a professor of law at Syracuse University College of Law. She is the Laura J. and L. Douglas Meredith Professor of Teaching Excellence she is the founding director of the College of Law's Disability Law and Policy Program. She is also a professor of disability studies at the Syracuse School of Education. And her positions actually go on. That's just a partial list. Professor Cantor publishes and lectures extensively on domestic and international human rights uh, concerning disability law and policy. She has written a gazillion law review articles on the topics, on the topic, and 10 books. Her most recent book is called The Development of Disability Rights Under International Human Rights Law, From Charity to Human Rights. And this book traces the development of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. She previously, as a matter of fact, worked with the UN Committee that drafted that treaty. And since then, she has consulted with governments and disability organizations 
on implementing the treaty's protections. Uh, and she's done this in more than a dozen countries. So I'm very honored now to present Professor Arlene Cantor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, I want to thank Professor Susan Batensky, the director of the Tolsky Center, and for the center for inviting me. I also want to thank her assistant, Marie Annette Gordon, for arranging all these logistics for me. And thank you all for joining me today. Um, in, Susan, in Professor Batensky's introduction, she mentioned the Nazi plan to exterminate people with disabilities. What you may or may not know is the United States Supreme Court, in a case called Buck versus Bell many years ago, but which is still precedent in this country, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes declared that women who were diagnosed or labeled as intellectually disabled could be involuntarily sterilized because he wrote, we're shaking our heads, some of you know, three generations of imbeciles is enough. So in our, own his, in our own country, we have a history of a legacy that has looked at people with disabilities as less than human, not entitled to parent, to make decisions about their own lives. And I want to share with you today what's happening around the world to address these concerns, not just in the United States, but in many countries. Um, so two things before we start. One. I want to thank our sign language interpreters, Teresa and Mitch, who will be here, in case there are any people here who are deaf and need sign language interpreting, which I typically do when I give talks. And to um, Kelly, who is typing in CART. For those of you who never seen CART before, it's very similar to court reporting. When you go to conferences in other countries, it allows you to see things in English, perhaps. And this allows people who are deaf or other learning disabilities to be able to see not only hear my words. Why is this important to me? And I really thank Professor Batensky and her staff for arranging this, because I know it's not the norm. It's important because I'm talking about equal rights of people with disabilities. And to talk about equal rights and access, we all have to have equal rights and access. So thank you so much for doing this today. OK, <clears throat> here I go. And I have had laryngitis, but unfortunately, I have a voice today. We'll see how long it lasts. These are not good times for those of us who care about human rights, right? In the United States and throughout other parts of the world, we are witnessing attacks on human rights, sometimes in the guise of nationalism. But given the number of wars that continue to rage, the unprecedented number of immigrants, displaced persons, and refugees with no homes or even countries to call their own, and murderous attacks by our citizens on other citizens in this country based on their race or religion, ethnicity, gender, or sexual identity, together with the prolonged poverty and violence and inequality that continues in the US and throughout the world, there are those who now are saying that the entire human rights regime has failed. Eric Posner, a law scholar, claims that human rights have made no difference in the lives of people around the world and arguing that we should, quote, face the fact and move on. Similarly, Stephen Hopgood, in his book, The End Time of Human Rights, argues that human rights are powerless to address equality. And Makua Ma Matua, in his book called Human Rights, a Political and Cultural Critique, presents a related argument that human rights treaties simply do not work because they have not resulted in greater economic equality and opportunities, particularly in the global south. Stephen Moyne, another scholar in a book called Human Rights in the Age of Inequality, calls the UN human rights regime, quote, dead on arrival. Even the human rights section of the International Studies Association, last session, Association proposed a session last year called The End, What's Wrong with Human Rights? I'm happy to report, however, that the American section of the International Society of Law, hosted in New York last month, had a, treat, had a session called why treaties do matter. So this is a very, let's say, hot topic. <clears throat> How many of you have taken a human rights course? 
Okay, so those of you who didn't raise your hand, you will before you finish here, very important. Although if you realize in the United States there's no requirement for our law students to learn international law, international human rights, I think that will change as the world is becoming a bit smaller. But there are now scholars throughout this country who are arguing that the human rights treaties mean nothing and we should abandon the project. I would say that while it may be true that human rights treaties have not ended all abuses and inequalities and poverty, they do make a difference in the lives of millions of people around the world. They're not designed to solve all the problems, nor could they, but they have been a positive influence in the lives of many people throughout the world, including people with disabilities, which I'll talk about today. So instead of apologizing, what some scholars now do, for what human rights laws have not accomplished, I am arguing today that treaties do result in change, but it's change that is good and gradual, disorderly, often a constellation of different events, and it takes time for any law or any treaty to be understood and applied and for people to rally behind it and mobilize for its enforcement. For example, the Convention Against Torture, which the US and 165 other countries have ratified, has resulted, it's been documented, in reducing incidents of state-sponsored torture, not eliminating, but reducing. Ratification of the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women is also result resulting in improvements in women's living conditions and greater employment opportunities for women in various countries throughout the world. Similarly, the Convention on the Rights of the Child has brought inoculations as well as education to millions of children, even in the most remote countries on Earth. It takes time. In this talk today, I want to discuss our newest UN treaty, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, as an example of a human rights treaty that is making a difference. And for the first time in the history of the world, the CRPD is making it clear that disability rights are human rights. It was adopted in 2006, and yes, I had the privilege of working on it for those five years of its drafting. And since then, it has been ratified <coughs> by 177 countries throughout the world, but not the US, and I'll get to that. The CRPD is changing state practices, ensuring new protections, opportunities, and more importantly of all, in my view, it is resulting in the participation of people with disabilities in society, some for the first time. During the next 50 minutes or so, I will argue that the CRPD is making a difference, not only because of what it says, because we know, right? We're all lawyers, law students or lawyers here, right? Laws are just words on paper, right? They don't really mean anything until they're implemented. I will argue that the CRPD is having an effect <clears throat> because grassroots organizations are taking what it says and acting on it to result in policy reform. I'll provide examples for you from my own research in other countries and observations of how the CAB, CRPD is transforming societies for the betterment not only of people with disabilities, for people without disabilities as well. My talk is divided into <coughs> five parts. <coughs> First, I'll make the case of why disability rights are human rights. <coughs> then I will discuss the convention and the difference it's making. Third, I'll consider why so many countries ratified treaties in the first place and why perhaps they ratified the CRPD. <coughs> then I will talk about the US history of ratifying the CRPD. And then I'll discuss some lessons learned and hopefully have time for questions and a voice to answer them. Excuse me. <coughs> okay, disability rights are human rights. What are human rights? We all know human rights are those rights that we have because we're born. Because we're born as human beings, regardless of where we were born, what our age or sex, ethnicity, religion, language, abilities, or income are, doesn't matter. We're all equally entitled to human rights without discrimination. Human rights are expressed by law in the form of treaties. <coughs> and in these human rights treaties, they impose on state parties and governments obligations to act or refrain from acting on behalf of the betterment of their, of their citizens. Human rights treaties are designed to protect fundamental freedoms of individuals and groups. But they're not always self-evident, are they? <coughs> I haven't talked for two days trying to preserve this voice. I hope you'll make it. It was not until 1995, for example, that the United Nations Fourth World Con Conference on Women 
in Beijing when former <coughs> Secretary Clinton declared that women's rights are linked to human rights. She wrote, she stated, if there is one message that echoes forth from this conference, let it be that human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights once and for all. <coughs> let us not forget that among those rights are the right to speak freely and the right to be heard. <coughs> Until recently, people with disabilities were not heard. They were also not seen, not respected, not valued, and not even counted as people within the international human rights legal system. In the 1970s, for example, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International brought international attention to the, <coughs> to the plight of political prisoners detained in Soviet mental hospitals. <coughs> These organizations fought for and succeeded in arranging the release of political prisoners from Soviet hospitals. That was a human rights issue. But human rights organizations did nothing to help the thousands of people labeled as mentally ill who were forced to remain in those psychiatric hospitals. That was not seen as a human rights issue. Even today, at least 80% of women <clears throat> in psychiatric institutions in every country in the world <clears throat> are abused and assaulted, including in our own. Such cases of abuse are never reported, often not investigated or prosecuted. People with disabilities are simply not believed. There are two cases that have just been brought before the Inter-American Court on Human Rights <coughs> against Guatemala and Mexico for the trafficking and abuse of women with mental disabilities in institutions there. That is because now, finally, abuse of people with disabilities has become a human rights issue. A couple slides here, and I want to apologize as they are disturbing. <coughs> this is a slide <coughs> of a young boy in the Willowbrook State Hospital in New York in the early <coughs> 1970s. There was part of a book called Christmas in Purgatory, in which a former professor at Syracuse University compiled photos of conditions there, presented them to Congress, which resulted in awareness for the first time followed by reports by Geraldo Rivera about the conditions there, that's how he made his name originally, and the abuse of children in institutions in the 1970s. This was taken just a couple years ago when I was investigating conditions in Turkey. In Turkey, Burka Koy, which is its largest psychiatric hospital, uses ECT, electric shock therapy, to deter patient misbehaviors. It's used on adults and children, and it was used without, without anesthesia which according to international law is considered torture. This photo, also from Turkey in 2006, is a child. Now, you may think this is a young child. This child was eight years old, confined always in a crib, where his bones had atrophied from no movement, and where Coke bottles were tied to his hands. Why? To prevent him from hurting himself. If you don't get affection in any way, you start hurting yourself because you demand some sort of physical contact. <clears throat> These photos were taken top right is a photo <coughs> of men lying on the ground <coughs> at Berkakori, that same psychiatric hospital in Turkey. This is a photo of a young boy we saw when we just visited an institution in Romania. And this photo here was taken just this past June, one of many, in orphanages in Kenya. And we've just released a report, which I'll talk about later, of abuse of children throughout the world in orphanages and institutions. I ask you if these are human rights issues. I hope you'll agree that finally they are. Why? <coughs> because in 2001, the UN appointed a committee to start thinking about how existing human rights laws can be applied to people with disabilities. Why is that important? In the US today, one in five people have a disability. That's more than 56 million Americans, 1.8 billion people around the world. It's the largest minority of people in the world. <clears throat> and yet, until this convention, people with disabilities were not recognized under international law. <clears throat> <clears throat> the CRPD, as I'll call it, tries to change this view. 
It makes visible the lived experiences and abilities of people with disabilities, as well as the many barriers that society erects to prevent them from participating fully. The CRPD establishes for the first time clearly that disability rights are human rights under international law. I now want to provide a brief background of the CRPD and talk a little bit about how I think it's having an impact. CRPD clearly is making a difference in the lives of many people around the world. <clears throat> it was drafted in only five years, which is a record for any treaty, and it had the most signatories on any opening day. After 20 countries ratified it, it was entered into force in May 2008. Before that, there were international documents that addressed the rights of people with disabilities, <clears throat> but they were not binding. <clears throat> and therefore, some may say that with the CRPD, we've now established that human rights include disability rights, and we can stop the advocacy. One could argue, though, also, that advocating for a separate treaty was discriminatory. Why? If you want people with disabilities to be included in society, why have a separate treaty for them? That's segregation, right? Make sure that the existing treaties are applied to people with disabilities. But what research throughout the world found, that unless there was a separate law or a separate treaty that recognized the particular issues and challenges facing people with disabilities, they would not be addressed. And I'll remind us, before 1975, maybe before many of you <clears throat> were even alive, <clears throat> children with disabilities did not attend public school. When I grew up, there were no kids with disabilities in my classrooms. It wasn't until 1975 that we had a law that declared children with disabilities had the right to attend public school. Okay? That's what the law can do. And clearly, the CRP recognized that there was a need for <coughs> a binding international law to raise this issue. The CRPD itself contains 50 articles. <clears throat> it covers all aspects of life, including core principles of autonomy, independence, non-discrimination, equality of opportunity. Those you've heard before, if any of you have taken international rights, human rights, right? You hear those in other documents. But it also includes, for example, respect for the right to respect for differences. Acceptance of disability as part of human diversity, the right to full inclusion, <clears throat> and the right to support, accommodations, and communication access. Those are new. So CRPD, I argue, in my writing, <clears throat> is making a difference, not in relation to some ideal society, but in relation to how things have been in the past. And I think that's how we have to gauge successes. In support of my argument, let me identify six different areas where I think CRPD is making a difference. <coughs> Thank you so much. I'm constantly there. OK, sorry. Okay, number one, the CRPD's view of people with disabilities and their role in society. It's new and it's different. The first way in which the CRPD is making a difference is the way it is changing society's view of who people with disabilities are. For centuries, people with disabilities have been viewed as people who are in need of care or charity or medical treatment, not people entitled to rights. They weren't viewed as human beings who are entitled to dignity and autonomy. As a result, policies have been developed to deprive people with disabilities of their humanity and their legal personhood. In most, if not all, countries in the world, <coughs> they have been subjected to neglect, abuse, segregation, exclusion, and discrimination. Why? <coughs> Just because they were born with <coughs> or may have acquired a disability. <coughs> Even today, in some countries where I have worked, children who are born with disabilities are not allowed to register at birth. Let's think about that. They're not even registered as people when they're born. <coughs> people with cognitive or psychosocial disabilities are denied legal capacity. What does that mean? They're not seen as legal people in the eyes of the law. They're not permitted to make any decisions about their own lives. <coughs> They can't decide where to live, with whom, what to do each day. 
or can't decide where to work, go to school, or how their bodies will be treated, what medical treatment they can accept or refuse. From 2001 to 2006, hundreds of people with disabilities themselves <coughs> came to the UN <coughs> to help draft the CRPD. There, they proclaimed that they were no longer willing to be accepting second-class citizenship. They developed the slogan, nothing about us without us. They affirmed that they are rights holders, not merely recipients of services, treatment, or charity. And they learned that what causes their exclusion from society is not their disability, but rather those attitudinal, physical, and legal barriers that prevent them from participating. And I want to give two examples. Number one, <coughs> when people with disabilities, all kinds of disabilities, showed up at the UN to participate in drafting the CRPD, that was big. That was news. That never happened before. It also required the United, how many of you visited the UN ever? <coughs> the building in New York? Well, with all these people there, it made the UN realize how inaccessible it was. Right? There weren't enough accessible restrooms. There weren't enough accessible elevators. So if you go visit the UN now, they've just completed a five-year major renovation to make it accessible. So I guess one example I can give, the CRPD matters, <coughs> it resulted in the UN building itself becoming more accessible. OK. <clears throat> but these people who came to the UN to help work on this treaty <coughs> returned to their home countries and began to work for change using the CRPD as a guidepost. And I've seen these efforts firsthand and how the CRPD is being used to organize people and to draft new laws and policies in countries as follows, Argentina, Egypt, India, Ireland, Israel, Jordan, Kenya, Mexico, <coughs> Palestine, Peru, Portugal, Turkey, South Africa, and Vietnam, etc. I would argue that without this treaty, <coughs> <clears throat> this grassroots global disability movement would not have emerged. And without this grassroots, mobility, grassroots movement, the CRPD would not be implemented. Civil society organizations, organizations of people with disabilities and their allies began to develop programs to enforce protections. In Kenya and Peru, for example, there are coalitions for the first time that are working to educate police about how to investigate cases of violence against women with disabilities as part of a project that I'm involved in with Handicap International. Countries around the world are now developing women with disability programs run by them to try to stop abuse and violence and seek education for women with disabilities. So first, I think the first impact is that the CRP is doing what it's supposed to do. It is bringing men, women, and children with disabilities out of the shadows onto the international stage as agents for change demanding recognition under law. Second, <clears throat> second example how I think CRPD is making a difference is its impact on the development of new laws and policies. Of the 177 countries that have ratified the CRPD, most now have new domestic disability laws or amending existing laws to conform to the CRPD. Not exactly, but almost. These laws <coughs> are affecting change within the individual countries. I was involved, for example, in drafting Vietnam's new disability law. They never had a disability law. It now is promoting the policies of education and employment of people with disabilities in a way that had never been seen before. In South Sudan, in Bulgaria, Georgia, Hungary, India, Ireland, Croatia, Costa Rica, Colombia, all of these countries now have enacted new laws that are trying to implement protections for people with disabilities. <coughs> and with these new laws are also changing attitudes about who people with disabilities are. A third way the CRPD is making a difference, I would argue, is the effect on the human rights treaty system. <coughs> people with disabilities came to the UN and assisted in drafting a treaty. That had never happened before in the same way from now on, I think, that when treaties are drafted, the constituents that are most affected will demand a place at the table. That's new. The CRPD also combines civil and political rights and positive negative rights into one document in a way that even the CEDA, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, didn't quite do. Because the CRPD stands for the proposition that all of its articles are interdependent, that civil and political rights can't be realized until you have related social, economic, and cultural rights. 
What does it mean? The right of access to justice sounds great, right? But if you go to a voting place last week and you can't use your hands and you can't fill out a ballot, what difference does it make that you have a right to access justice? You need to be able to have the voting machines, the voting places, right? The courthouses accessible to all. <clears throat> The interdependency of the many substantive rights included in the CRPD, as well as the responsibility of the governments to protect those rights are the most important and novel aspects of, I think, this convention. Future drafting committees, future committees that work on treaties, will now have to look to the CRPD as an example that combines civil, political, negative, and positive rights into one document. Four. The fourth way in which the CRPD is, quote, making a difference <coughs> is by creating new rights and reinterpreting existing rights. <coughs> the drafters of the CRPD made it clear that they had no intention of creating any new human rights, but they did. For the first time under international law, we have now a right of people with disabilities <coughs> to, quote, live in the community with choices equal to others. <coughs> the right to reasonable accommodations, the right to communication access and accessibility. These are all, I argue, new human rights. And they may have implications beyond people with disabilities. In fact, right now, there's a group that's working on a new treaty on the behalf of older people and elders' rights treaties that is looking to some of these rights to be incorporated. Another new, rec new right recognized for the first time in the CRPD is inclusive education. The right to education is included in many other <coughs> human rights documents, including the Convention on the Rights of the Child. But never before has any treaty included a right <coughs> to inclusive education. This right has now become a model for new laws in Kenya, Tanzania, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and Spain. <coughs> And two months ago, a South African court held that under the CRPD, children with disabilities have a right to inclusive education and that the government must spend whatever money is necessary to ensure the right of kids with disabilities to attend neighborhood schools. That is, by the way, more than any court in the United States has ever said. The CRPD also offers a new vision of a social order, I say, that values not only differences, but more generally a value of interdependency. Interdependency, not independence. <clears throat> I need some more tissues, I think, from my purse. I have in my purse here. This view stands in sharp contrast to the liberal rights-based approach. Like rights-based, what do I mean? It focuses on the individual, the right of the individual, right, as a desired social goal. The United States is perhaps the country that places highest possible value on independence, right? Thank you very much. Each of us is expected to achieve success, hi, by pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Have you heard that expression? We're individuals. We can do it by ourselves. Independence is good. Dependence is bad. But over the past few decades, feminist scholars have challenged the value society places on independence and argue that we have become so fixated as a society, and here in particular, at the social status of independence that we have failed to recognize the inevitability and normalcy of dependency. In fact, let's think about it. None of us are really independent, right? We need other people. Other people help us make decisions. They help us in many ways. Dependency rather than independence is the natural state. The CRPD stands for the proposition that all people, regardless of their label, impairment, limitation, challenge, ability, disability, are entitled to equality, dignity, and autonomy, as well as the support and accommodations they need to live their lives. According to the CRPD, therefore, no individual does or should have to live completely independently, and no longer may society, more importantly, exclude a group of people based on their membership and the group of people who are dependent. <clears throat> as such, the CRPD introduces what I call this new right to support that may serve as an important source for evaluating and defining human relations in the future. 
It remains to be seen exactly how the CRPD's new view of dependency will practically affect the lives of people. <coughs> but it is undeniable that there's already been a significant shift in our conception of the meaning of autonomy and independence, and even what a human right may mean as a result of the CRPD. Two more reasons, five. The CRPD, the CRPD includes a specific article on awareness raising. That's not in any other treaty. <coughs> article 8 requires state parties to adopt immediate, effective, and appropriate measures to raise awareness through society and to foster respect for the rights and dignity of persons, to combat stereotypes, prejudices, and harmful practices relating to persons with disabilities, including those based on sex and age in all areas of life, and promote awareness of the capabilities and contributions of persons with disabilities, right? That's new. No prior treaty has ever included an article about awareness raising, and no stronger language, in my view, could have been included to show <coughs> the urgency and priority of awareness raising as integral to the goals of the convention. Combating exclusion of people with disabilities is not only a matter of law, it's a matter of changing attitudes. <coughs> Number six, the CRPD provides a model for more rigorous international and domestic, <coughs> more, <coughs> more rigorous international and domestic reporting and monitoring requirements. The reporting and monitoring requirements of human rights treaties, for those of you taking human rights law, are often referred to as something like, quote, the most powerless, underfunded, formulaic, politically manipulated institutions in the UN, right? We have treaties but we don't have a way really to enforce them because the reporting and monitoring mechanisms aren't strong enough. The drafters of the CRPD were well aware of these critiques. They responded by including in this convention the most stringent monitoring and reporting requirements of any human rights treaty ever. It offers a new, I think, and potentially better model for the enforcement of all human rights protections under international law. It includes, for example, not only requirements for international monitoring, but also requirements regarding national monitoring and reporting. It requires the creation of independent coordinating mechanisms, the establishment of a focal point, and data collection that has never been required in other treaties in the past. The CRPD committee that's charged with reading country reports and implementing and suggestions to those countries are now providing more detailed concluding observations, responses to country reports than any other committee I can see ever before. <clears throat> I think this approach may provide a model for new human rights committees in the future. Okay, so there are six reasons why I think the CRPD is making a difference, not only to people with disabilities, but beyond. And I just want to step back for a minute and now say, okay, this is great, but why on earth did countries ratify the treaty? Why do they ratify treaties in the first place, right? For those of you who study this, you know that when a country ratifies a treaty, what happens? What happens when a country ratifies a treaty? Anyone? Anyone here, right? It becomes part of domestic law, right? Depending how the process in the government works, whether it's a monist and dualist, but it can become part of enforceable domestic law. So why on earth would a country ratify a treaty and give over some of its own sovereignty to some international body? Kind of counterintuitive, don't you think? So this is a question that many scholars have inquired about. There's a lot of articles about it. I won't go into all the research. But it appears that countries ratify treaties more often because there's some advantage to them, but it's not that they really care about what the words of the treaty say, right? <clears throat> what are the advantages? They're willing to give up some of their sovereignty, perhaps for increased international reputation, international aid, and other benefits that can flow to it. Now, one scholar, Una Hathaway, has written and done a study <laughs> about human rights treaties, and I won't go into it too much to save my voice, but she looked at different countries and found that not only did treaty ratification not result in better practices on the ground, a better human rights record, but that in fact, in some countries, the more human rights treaties they ratified, the worst human rights practices were recorded by at least the US State Department. Okay, that's a pretty bad indictment for human rights treaties. I've written a lot about Hathaway's study. I criticized it on many grounds. <coughs> and the one thing I'd like to mention here today is that, for the purpose of our discussion, I guess, is that she examined state practices right before ratification and right after ratification, right? Right before, pre, and post ratification. 
It forgets that change, like any law, takes time. Just think about our ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act here. It was enacted in 1990, fully effective in 1992. How many of you have entered these days banks, law offices, doctor's offices, or maybe even a building on this campus and find that it's not accessible? Are there, when you get in the elevator, is there a voice that's telling you when to get off? That's required, right? We should know for people who can't see. The elevator should be telling us. Many issues of accessibility are still not realized today, 2018, even though the law was passed in 1990 and became a fully effective in 92. Simply put, the effectiveness of any law, including an international treaty, cannot be measured at some magic moment. The effectiveness has to be examined in context and over years and not days. Moreover, I'd argue that if treaties are as meaningless as Hathaway seems and other scholars seem to say, one would think that countries would decide to ratify either all treaties or none. But that's not the case, right? Every member state of the UN, for example, except the US, has ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. But much fewer, many fewer countries have ratified the Convention Against Torture. If ratifying a treaty is just something countries do, then why aren't they all ratifying all the treaties? <clears throat> the fact that so many countries have ratified the CRC and much fewer have ratified the CAT, the Convention Against Torture, may mean to me that countries actually think about their decisions to ratify a treaty and think about it in terms of their own state practices. If they believe that ratifying a treaty won't cause too many changes in their country, then go ahead, ratify it. But if they think that ratifying a treaty will force them to change some state practices, they may be less reluctant and less eager, more reluctant and less eager <clears throat> to ratify a treaty. So we know that treaties may countries may decide to ratify treaties for many reasons, international reputation, they want to follow regional neighbors. It's a choice, basically, in their history, their legal political system, cultural and religious traditions, how rich or poor it is, et cetera. So why did so many countries decide to ratify the CRPD? Wouldn't we like to know? There's no way to know for sure. But it seems that one of the most common reasons for ratification of the CRPD, like other treaties, is that their neighbors did. As we look at the regions of the Africa, Middle East, Latin America, for example, we see peer pressure at work. Those countries were apparently interested in complying with regional norms and interested in boosting their international reputation, even within and among their neighbors. Another explanation I'd offer for the widespread ratification may be the country's interest in showing the rest of the world how progressive it is, at least regarding a, quote, safe human rights issue like disability rights, right? Now think about this, a treaty enforcing the rights of people with disabilities, how can that be bad? How, how controversial is that, right? We want to help those poor, pitiable creatures, the argument goes. If those societies had viewed people with disabilities as less than human or just in need of medical treatment and charity, how bad could it be to give a treaty that says, yes, they should be treated well? So in those countries that adopt a charitable or medical model of disability, the potential benefits in terms of international respect and maybe international aid was deemed worthy in comparison to assumed to be low price of ratification. And this is true especially where there had been no advocacy movements around disability in those countries. On the other hand, other countries that decided to ratify the CRPD, <coughs> such as countries in Latin America, Canada, and Australia, they have a long history of human rights advocacy. They already ratified the CEDAW, Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CRC, Convention on Rights of the Child, and they may have assumed that ratifying the CRPD is not only consistent with their past practices, but is the next logical step in ensuring legal protections for their citizenry. The CRPD is simply the next treaty to endorse. <coughs> Oh, it's contagious, sorry. Okay, so it appears based on this quick review of why countries ratify treaties, and I know it's quick, there's a lot in there, <clears throat> including the CRPD, it appears that most countries choose to ratify treaties because it's in their interest, broadly defined. But that doesn't appear to be the case for the United States, right? <clears throat> the United States is one of a few countries, the only industrial country in the world that's failed to ratify the CEDAW. In fact, of the nine core human rights treaties, does anyone know, the United States has ratified only 
Do I hear one? Do I hear two? Three, stop. Only three of the nine. So in the United States, basically, we have the worst treaty ratification record in the world, the worst record of any country that we often compare ourselves to, Australia, UK, France, Germany, Canada, worse than them all. They've all ratified most of the treaties. So some commentators have gone so far as to suggest that our failure to ratify human rights treaty not only reflects poorly on the United States internationally, but also adversely affects our ability to conduct foreign policy. Now, even before World War II, politicians had mounted a campaign to limit the effect of international law. This isn't new. It culminated in legislators of both parties opposing American involvement in conflicts in Asia and Europe. Even before World War I, Senator Nye, a Republican senator from North Dakota, held hearings attempting to show that America was forced into World War I by, quote, an alliance of arms merchants, bankers, and foreign influences. With the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, those non-interventionists, as they were called, were silenced temporarily. And following the conclusion of World War II, the US became a leader in helping to establish the entire international human rights system, right? Eleanor Roosevelt was one of the drafters of the UN Charter. But by the early 1950s, some US legislators sought to renew again efforts to block the effect of international law on the US. One scholar has written, and I just like this quote, that the United States came, quote, kicking and screaming into the modern world of international human rights treaties. In fact, it took the US more than just about 40 years until 1988 to ratify the very first human rights treaty against genocide, which is regarded as probably one of the least controversial treaties of all. In the 1970s, opposition to treaties I aim from representatives from southern states who organized against international law use in the United States because of fear that the government would use treaties as a vehicle for engaging in civil rights reform domestically. <clears throat> Subsequent administrations of Carter, Clinton, and even Reagan succeeded in renewing the country's commitment to international human rights law and signed and ratified several treaties. But with the 9-11 attacks, as you know, um, President George Bush chose a different path, focusing on domestic security and not international human rights. This path obviously has continued, and I would say with zeal, under the current administration's commitment to America first and its decision to pull out of the climate treaty, the Reagan era nuclear arms treaty with Russia, reinstating sanctions against Iran, and most recently, its stance against the use of international human rights protections for the right of refugees to seek asylum. What this history seems to teach us, what this history teaches us, it seems to me, is that although the US was one of the main supporters and leaders of the development of the international human rights system, <coughs> our nation has remained, I'll say politely, divided on whether and to what extent the US should participate in international law. The history is reflected in the US Senate's decision most recently to refuse to ratify the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Now the CRPD, you have to understand, is modeled specifically after the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA itself was the result of bipartisan support. President George Bush Sr. signed the original version of the ADA in 1990. And his son, George W., signed <coughs> the amended version of the ADA in 2008. <clears throat> Yet early on in the drafting process at the UN on the CRPD, the Bush administration went on record stating that it would not sign the CRPD, and it prohibited US Justice Department attorneys who were present at the UN drafting meetings to intervene in the drafting. In fact, not only were the Korea Justice, Deter Justice Department attorneys with expertise in disability law removed from the process, but in their place, the Bush administration appointed a young junior level political appointee with no experience in human rights or disability law to be the US spokesperson at the drafting process. <clears throat> in the administration's view, there was simply no need for the CRPD because of the existence of the ADA. Okay, maybe it sounds fair, right? Yet, other countries in, throughout Europe, as well as Australia, Canada, and Israel, also have strong domestic disability laws. They chose to ratify the CRPD, as have numerous other countries throughout the Americas, Asia, and Latin America, and Africa. 
In fact, most of those countries' domestic disability laws are also modeled on the ADA. And their domestic laws became the reason those countries decided to support and ratify the CRPD, not to refuse to ratify it the way the US Senate did. During the presidential campaign of 2008, Canada Obama pledged to sign the CRPD, and he did, after election, referring the CR to the CRPD as, quote, extraordinary and ensuring equal protection and equal benefits be the before the law for all citizens, reaffirming the inherent dignity and worth and independence of all persons with disabilities worldwide. <clears throat> Three years later, in May 2012, President Obama transmitted the CRPD to the United States Senate, which he's required to do as president, for advice and consent to ratification. That's required, by the way, under the US Constitution. That's the way we do things. Since then, the US Senate brought the, rat the ratification up for a vote twice. And on both occasions, they failed to garner the two-thirds majority that's required for ratification. The last time, they missed by only five votes. So given the current composition of the Senate, and I had to wait to see how to write this paragraph, <laughs> I will say that it is unlikely that the CRPD will now receive the votes it needs for ratification during this administration. As one of the only countries that has not ratified the CRPD, and really the only country that has not ratified the CRPD that it has its own domestic disability law, the US is choosing to remain an outlier in the monitoring enforcement of human rights worldwide generally and losing its credibility abroad, I would argue, at least with regard to its role as a leader in disability rights. Conclusion. <clears throat> I have argued here that the CRPD makes clear that disability rights are human rights and that the CRPD itself is having an impact in the way in which societies are organized, mobilizing people with disabilities, and developing new domestic and international legal norms. The CRPD makes clear that disability are human rights and that abuse, segregation, marginalization, discrimination, and mistreatment should end. But will they? Will the widespread ratification of the CRPD result in people with disabilities being accepted as members of societies in which they live, not charitable causes or passive recipients of services? You tell me. Even in those countries <coughs> which expected no change upon their ratification of the CRPD, we're beginning to see changes in those countries. I make this observation, by the way, in the context of what appears to be an inverse relationship between the political structure of a country and the potential for change. Let me explain. Countries that do not have a history of human rights protections generally, and I'll use Pakistan as an example that I've recently researched with a student from Pakistan. Those countries may have a greater potential to make the most changes in society as a result of the CRPD, as opposed to countries with a history of human rights enforcement. I'm not arguing here that the CRPD is most likely benefiting people in, quote, developing countries in the global south, as opposed to more developed, quote, countries in the global north. But what I have seen is that one of the most important determinants for achieving greater equality for people with disabilities in any country is the willingness and ability of people with disabilities and their allies to organize themselves, to organize themselves for the advancement of their own rights and to demand a place at the, ta ta place at the table. So far, the situation seems to have occurred in both democratic and non-democratic countries in the global north and south. Although neither the CRPD nor any human rights treaty can ever solve all the problems of the world, such treaties should nonetheless be given credit for those problems that they have begun to address successfully. So as we analyze the success of the CRPD, it seems to me that we should ask not whether the CRPD has eliminated all discrimination and mistreatment of all people with disabilities in those countries that have ratified it, but rather, what and how has this treaty contributed to the chances that human beings will enjoy their rights more fully than would have been the case in the absence of this treaty? 
As I have shown, the CRPD is a significant step towards achieving equality for people with disabilities under national law. It recognizes the rights and needs of people with disability while presenting a new view of dependency as a part of the natural human condition, as well as a new human right to accommodation and support. Once a country decides to ratify the CRPD and conform its domestic laws to it, some obvious changes are expected, right? First thing that happens, new laws in the books regarding the accessibility of buildings and transportation. That's what people think of first. <clears throat> but conforming to the CRPD is not just about making changes in buildings and transportation systems. <clears throat> to include, really include, people with disabilities in society so they feel they belong to, that's the goal of the CRPD. It requires countries and all of us to make fundamental changes, including redefining who is included and who is not, who is responsible for their own actions and who is denied legal capacity under law, who has the right to be a parent, who has the right to have sex, who has the right to be born, who can comment on their own medical treatment, who can refuse treatment, who can live freely in the community with supports, who gets to decide what the supports are, who can be subjected to torture in the name of treatment, and who can work and attend this university. <clears throat> Ratifying the CRPD means making visible the needs, rights, and potential political power of people with disabilities. Indeed, one of the most important tools for implementing any human rights treaty is to make visible, invisible harms. Catherine Sickink has written that human rights treaties, quote, make visible, invisible harms, and in the process of doing so, raises the bar of what constitutes human rights in the first instance. At its core, the CRPD presents a new vision of a social order that not only values differences based on disability as part of diversity, but also values as a social good the different ways in which people may live, work, act, think, walk, talk, love, make decisions with and without supports. The implementation of the CRPD, therefore, involves changing the very nature and fabric of society, <coughs> reordering some government priorities, and creating places at the table for new constituencies. Additional research is needed to show empirically the advances in various countries with respect to the rights and participation of people with disabilities, and that's a project that I'm working on now. Thus, although the CRPD may not eradicate all discrimination and mistreatment worldwide, it is nonetheless, in Catherine Sicken's works, quote, quote, no small thing that countries now accept disability rights as human rights as they work to alter their domestic laws to address the many injustices to which people with disabilities have been subjected and to ensure their human rights protections under international human rights law. It is also no small thing, I would add, that excluding and mistreating people with disabilities will no longer be tolerated by people with disabilities themselves their families, and their allies. <clears throat> Thus, the message of the CRPD is clear. Disability are human rights, and they are here to stay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I'm very sorry, my coughing. So, OK, good. Yes, someone else talk, please. So, uh, Just identify yourself first, I, if you would. I'm Matt. I'm a 1L student here. OK. Um, so I'm wondering, do you think the reason for the lack of US ratification of major human rights treaties is because of a political distrust of the international legal framework and that the US actually does have a fair human rights record? Or is it because the US has a poor human rights record that it's trying to hide? A little bit of both, I suppose. I mean, what I've tried to show in this paper and in my longer writing projects is that this is not new. That's been a history and always a strain in this country between those who want to look to international law and those who don't. And I'll add that um, both Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg and Justice O'Connor have written about how they have both received death threats after referring to international law in their Supreme Court decisions. Wow. In the Ginsburg decision, it involved, I can't believe I remember the case right now. I'll think about it in one second. But it's a case involved, um, Atkins, in a case involved a man who was considered, quote, mentally retarded, which we would not say intellectually disabled. Mm -hmm. He was sentenced to be executed. And the question before the court is, can the state execute someone who has an intellectual disability? And in that decision, Justice Ginsburg basically presented 
information from almost every country in the world to show that no other country, no other country, no other country executes someone who has an intellectual disability. After that decision, she received death threats, that there is no right of the US Supreme Court justice to have to talk about other countries. We do things ourselves. So this strain, this, this idea of not looking to international law has been around for a while. The idea we don't need international treaties because we do things better has been around for a while. But I, don't think, I think that we can empirically and policy-wise show that's not true. And so, for example, there's a case now pending. What is torture, for example? Okay, so that has come up here in the United States, even though we ratified the Convention Against Torture. There's a case pending now in the Inter-American Commission on Human Do everyone know the United States? We're part of the inter-American system. Who knew? Regional human rights law system. We don't even teach that in law school, right? So we have a case pending in the Inter-American inter Commission on Human Rights regarding torture in an institution in Massachusetts. And people are saying, well, did you exhaust? Yes, we have to exhaust our administrative remedies in the US before we go there. Why can't that be outlawed in the United States? It hasn't been. And so I think that it's a combination of both. I think there are practices here that could violate human rights law, clearly CDOC, and even issues around the CRC. There are issues that could arguably be seen as violative. And yet we do have some wonderful laws. The ADA is a fabulous law. So I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think that we have a history of different political views, different views about the role of international law. And in my area, if we're advocating for disabilities and human rights, we want to use as many laws as possible. And it's nothing that would have hurt the US to have ratified the CRPD. And I can talk about more. I didn't include in my paper why the Senate voted, what happened in the Senate. I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, but clearly, those are different. It's a great question, and those are the challenges Awesome today. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Um, hi, my name is Andrew Regan. I'm a 3L. Uh, thank you for coming, first of all. Secondly, uh, you just stated that uh, the CRPD certainly could not have hurt us had we ratified. Right. Okay, so, I mean, the ideas of what the role of a state is, uh, you know, goes back to the piece of Westphalia. Can countries even determine their own religion? This idea. And so I think that the philosophical ideologies that butt heads are not necessarily should we help uh, people with disabilities, but how should we help them? And to the extent that in today's world, if, if the CRPD was uh, ratified, we can make, Congress can make changes to the ADA tomorrow, assuming the president signs immediately. Uh, if the CRPD was ratified and we wanted to make additional changes to the ADA, in that circumstance, is the CRPD worded vaguely enough that we could make changes to the ADA, or would, would we, if we wanted to improve the ADA, violate an international treaty? That yeah, wouldn't okay. happen. Okay, great question. So <clears throat> you have a few things in there I'd like to respond to. Um, and I think the best way to do it maybe is to give you the, the arguments that we used against ratification of the CRPD, uh -huh. and then the responses. So one of the arguments was federalism, which you're kind of alluding to here. This idea that if we bring in a treaty, is a treaty going to force the federal government to do things that were left to the states? OK. Well, there are two responses. Number one, it's wrong. But number two, the response is that in addition to ratifying and signing the treaty, the country always has the option to include what's called reservations, understanding, or declarations, rights. The US has always, and other countries do as well, have a reservation that can say, or a declaration, that there's nothing in the ratification of this treaty means that it would affect certain implementation of state laws, for example. Why? Because when Congress ratifies a treaty in the United States, it's taking it as part of federal law. Okay? It's not affecting state laws at all. At all. I'll say it again. It's part of federal law. It doesn't affect state laws at all. So it's just wrong to think that ratifying a treaty will affect state laws and practices. And in fact, that was one of the arguments that was presented by something called the Homeschoolers Association. It was led by Senator Rick Santorum, and the head of the Homeschool Association argued that if we ratify the CRPD, that the rights of parents about where they send their kids to school would be put at risk, would be threatened. Okay, and I'm getting to your question about the ADA in a minute, okay? And eventually, they admitted that, I mean, this was a political ruse, because there's no basis in fact that a 
we have the federal laws on education, the IDA. That doesn't affect state law policies about homeschooling. I don't want to get too technical, but homeschooling is a state issue, not a federal issue. So it has nothing to do with that. But they tried to rev up parents with kids with disabilities to oppose the CRPD with this idea that they won't be able to decide where their kid has to go to school and that the government will somehow say that your kid has to go to a certain school. And it's just wrong, not the case. Okay. And that hasn't happened in any country. Second. So the, so the first thing I want to say is that the arguments that we used around federalism had no basis in fact, and that if there were concerns about federalism, the appropriate place the U.S. has always put that is in a run, a reservation understanding declaration. In terms of the ADA, the fact that <clears throat> the way it works here, that if a treaty becomes part of our law, it doesn't, it's a floor, not a ceiling. Okay? So the ADA is better than the CRPD in many regards. For example, the ADA and its regulations talk a lot about what has to be done in buildings to make them accessible. The CRP doesn't talk at all about that. The CRPD is much broader brush. It's general human rights language and terms. <clears throat> Some countries, for example, have quotas about employment. They've ratified the CRPD. The CRPD doesn't say anything about quotas. Does that mean those countries can't have quotas to promote employment people with disabilities? No. No. So it doesn't take away what we already have. It can add to it basically as more of a <coughs> statement of principles. And then it's up to the federal government and ultimately states to enact laws to implement it. So it wouldn't in any way risk the accomplishments we always have, already have. It could only add to it kind of additional thinking. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, sure. I, mean, I, want something else. I have additional comments. I'll probably stop here. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Yeah. I wonder what type of disabilities are discussed in the CRPD, because okay, I do mental health advocacy. Good. Sorry, my name is Emily, and I'm a 2L here. Okay, hi. Um, I do mental health advocacy, and I'm always advocating for um, mental illnesses such as PTSD and substance use disorders and addiction disorders to be qualified as um, disabilities. Okay, so two things. What? I'm such a teacher. I hate it. Have you taken an ADA class, a class of disabilities? No, yeah, no. Okay, so let me talk. I'll say about the ADA and the CRPD. The AID, ADA has very clear definitions of disability. You have to have a mental or physical disability impairment that significantly limits a major life activity, a record of an impairment, or being regarded as. Okay? It includes mental and physical disability, all of them. So long as it's a substantial limitation on a major life activity, it includes alcoholism, it includes people who are recovering from substance abuse, PTSD is clearly in there. Okay, so I said the CRPD is modeled after the ADA. So when we were drafting the CRPD, many people thought it would use that same three-part definition, which other countries now use as well. It didn't. There was a great discussion, two whole meetings, about what definition of disability should be included. And the conclusion was that there is no definition of disability in the CRPD. And I should have a slide. The first purpose, under the purpose section says, that the purpose of the CRPD is to address kind of the rights and needs of people with various long-term impairments who, because of their interaction with barriers in society, are unable to fully participate. <clears throat> the CRPD basically says it doesn't matter how your country defines disability. What the CRPD is addressing is the barriers you encounter and is forcing the governments to think about how to remove those barriers. So the CRP, there's no question that includes people with all kinds of mental disabilities, psychosocial disability, PTSD, you name it. And the question isn't whether someone is going to be fitting under the CRPD. The question is, what is society doing, the government programs, to get rid of barriers so people with PSDD can get accommodations so they can work, so they can access transportation, so they can get housing, things like that. Um, and so there is no definition. There's only the intent of the convention to include everyone. And I'll say one more thing about that, and this is a concrete example. And that is, for example, I wear glasses. A lot of us wear glasses. I can't tell. Some of you have contacts, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So a lot of us have vision, some kind of a vision thing going on. We wear glasses. Do we consider ourselves people with disabilities because we wear glasses? I mean, I'll speak for myself. No. In the United States in 2018, wearing glasses? Not a disability, right? No, should it be? But say you're in Guatemala and you're in some rural area, and you do weaving for a living, and that's how you provide for your family, and you lose your eyesight, and you can no longer do weaving, and you can no longer provide for your family, 
At that point, you may be considered a person with disability in Guatemala. Under those laws and policies, but not here. And so the CRPD drafters also wanted to be able to leave room for different countries and cultures to think about how they will include different people with different needs and different environments. Yes? Yeah. Um, so this is kind of out there. Um, but I guess my question is how the convention um, perceives some cultural ideology. So for example, I know in certain African cultures, um, the idea of children being witches and yep. that kind of thing. Um, People Genesis. with mental, not children so much, people with mental illnesses would be considered possessed by demons and witches and things, yeah. Right, so I guess my question is, does the CRPD, um, I guess, does it extend to cover those instances? Like, what, what's the room there? Because so, I see the argument that it's, oh, that's our culture, but right. also, where does this... Right. I mean, you're hitting on such an important point that we spend, and probably, Professor Butensky probably spends a lot of time talking about cultural relativism versus universal human rights. Are there things called universal human rights? But should we be looking at every culture and every country to see how it's adapted, okay? And I just say, um, one of the interesting issues, we, and I'll get to the which is issue in a minute, is genital mutilation, for example. <laughs> there was a question a few years ago about whether women who were subjected to genital mutilation in an African country could be given asylum here because they argued that if they were returned, they would be subjected to genital mutilation, which they saw as persecution, torture. So there was a question of the United States immigration courts deciding, well, are we going to say that general mutilation is torture that justifies giving someone asylum here or not? And as a woman law professor, I just want to tell you, when that case was going on, I told my students, I got so many emails from different listservs. You have to sign on to this brief to say that, no, we have to recognize that for many women in Africa, general mutilation is a rite of passage. It is accepted and valued by women in those communities. Sign on, the United States government should be saying what's permitted. And then the listservs from the other says, general mutilation is torture. We have to give asylum to this woman because she'll be returned. I mean, it was incredible, right? And I can, I can share you if you want, but I mean, I have my own view. But the court did say that this woman had substantiated the case where she had evidence that she had objected to this practice throughout her life, that her family doesn't practice that. It's not by her immediate family cultural heritage, she should be entitled to asylum that she got. Okay. So why am I giving you this example? Because you're raising a really important and difficult issue. What is part of a culture? And who is anyone else to come in and say that that should be a violation of human rights? And I personally have had to deal with this very recently when I was in Kenya. Because in Kenya, I did a lot of things, among others, was visit orphanages, where children were taken from families who were given maybe $5, told it or nothing, and told that, oh, you can't take care of your kid with a disability. We're going to take care of them. Give us your kid. Brought to these orphanages, where volunteers from all over the world come and pay to volunteer, where the orphanages pocket the money, and where the conditions of the children is so horrendous, and I have pictures, and we just issued a report. I was just telling Professor Batinsky about it. I'll send it with you and maybe distribute it to your student. We issued a report called Infanticide and Abuse in Orphanages in Kenya. Now, when we were there, we spent a lot of time with kids who had grown up in orphanages who are now working to stop this practice. What is my judgment? My judgment is to defer to them about what they see as the solutions. Do I think it's a human rights violation of what I saw and how those kids live? Yes. I think everyone would agree. There's no right of a kid to live in such horrible and to die so young because of those conditions, right? But how to remedy those violations has to be culture specific. And I can go on and on about this, but that's the bottom line. Yeah. Um, if you apply that same argument, um, we should allow cultures to essentially design their own solution to these problems. Well, in this case, yeah. In this case, but if you apply that to the larger problem of whether or not the United States adopts the CRPD, we have the ADA. We've, we've already adopted a culturally specific solution which we feel is adequate. Um, who that's feels a comment, and then... Who feels it's adequate? Our, our culture in general, I guess, because of the, the people that we have elected to the serve Senate, as our representatives, right. they, they made the decision. I'm not making any judgment call, I'm just saying we decided in that regard. Um, 
And I had a second question, which I just forgot, so I apologize. Okay, so uh, let me answer that, and then think of the second okay. one, because I want to hear. Okay. What the senators and I, I wrote an article I'm happy to send you. It's kind of a chapter of a book that's just coming out about all the different co countries and their, why they ratified or not, and I did the chapter in the U.S. And so I did a lot of research on what were there press releases by senators who opposed and supported the CRPD. What did they say afterwards? And what was interesting to me, and no surprise given our current climate, is that the Republican senators who rallied together to vote against the CRPD, all except Senator Centorum, who said, and Cruz alluded to, but Centorum talked about this homeschooling issue, they all basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, but there's no reason for a Democrat to have a success with a ratification. We are going to fight that ratification. That it wasn't really related to the issue per se, but it was more this idea that the Senator Harkin and the Democrats wanted the CRPD and they were going to oppose it. That makes me very sad because, yeah. as I said, I gave the history, that's never happened in the history of disability policy ever. And it's, that's why I wrote about it. I agreed to do this chapter because it was so stark to me. So that's a problem if they're not looking at the merits. Second issue is it's not as simple as we have this law. As I said, every other country, I mean, France, Germany, I've done a lot of research now in other countries. They have even stronger law. Israel, I had a <clears throat> Fulbright in Israel. I spent a lot of time looking at their law, actually. Anyway, and yeah, I mean, why are all those countries ratifying the CRPD when they also have their own domestic laws? Because there's something to be said by some, sometimes, in some countries, that an international approach to issues is or could be helpful. And I mean, I can't help to just, I mean, I, maybe we're getting too political, but it was, I watched the news when I was in the hotel this morning. And it's very upsetting to hear the president of France calling out our president about a World War I um, experience. And what we learned from World War I is that when countries do come together, there is a way to, ra to remedy problems throughout the world. And when countries were isolated and only concerned about themselves is why we had at least World War One. And so the idea of being part of an international community, I kind of like it. I'll put it that maybe that's just my personal politics. But I think that it is advantageous to Americans here. And I have to say it's humbled me personally as a law teacher to be able to learn about other countries' traditions and ideas. And I think it can make us even better if we are open to learn in that way. Yeah. Um, and then I remember my second question. Okay. Do you think the U.S. non-involvement in the drafting of the treaty and the pulling of capable individuals to participate yeah. uh, was anything more than a political move? Did it benefit us? Because <laughs> we, we had clearly already had an ABA, which is substantial. Um, and if we want to understand how the rest of the world is viewing human, you know, human rights uh, associated with people with disabilities, one of the best things we could do is exclude ourselves from that conversation as a tactic. Do you think that was part of it at all, or was it just okay. political level? Right. I'll say, I mean, I, maybe I overstated it or it wasn't clear. The U.S. presence was there. I mean, there were probably at least five Justice Department and or more officials there at every... The, the way the drafting went for five years, it was two times a year, in June and December, three weeks at a time. And I have a full-time gig, so I wasn't there for every meeting, but I was there for some of every meeting. The Justice, one sec, the Justice Department officials were at every drafting meeting twice a year for five years. They were instructed to not give official statements. I do not mean to imply that the U.S. was not involved in the drafting. You bet they were. And particularly until the end when these career disability folks were, these were the people who wrote the ADA, these are the people who do the regulations, they were very helpful. And for, like, there was a team of us who were lawyers who were, what was our role? Providing just information. I mean, really not advocating, but just here's the background. Here's how it says it in CEDAR, I'd say, or here's how it's CRC, or here's the stuff on education. That's what we did, and that's what they did. So they were involved in supporting the effort, but had made it clear they wouldn't support, they wouldn't um, um, sign it. The, ways that, the reason I think it was solely political is because the one time that the U.S. made a public statement towards the end of these five years, is when the Holy See, who is a member of the UN, the Holy See, the Vatican, made a statement that there should be nothing in the CRPD to be interpreted to support the right to abortion. Because there's a provision that says the right to life. Anyway, so the Holy See made this public statement. That was the only statement the Holy See made through the five years. And the United States, to everyone's shock, basically 
made a statement at the General Assembly of this drafting and said, and it's in my article, I can give you the citation, that we support the Holy See, there's nothing in the CRPD to support abortion. Where did that come from? And why was that even relevant at that point, given all the other provisions of the um, CRPD? So I don't know. I can't say it's purely political, but that was for a audience back home, I think. And correct me, this is 2002? The Wait. process was from 2001 to 2006. OK, so this statement was in when 2006, was, okay. by ish Say it again. I'm just trying to. Oh, I don't have my footnotes with me. I can look up the date that they it was, it was in a Republican presidency, so there was yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was Bush. It was the whole Bush presidency. Yeah. Okay. Um, but disability had never been really a political issue before. Anyway, this, I want to say one other thing. If we do, we have another minute. Um, what's the difference between the ADA and the CRPD? I think that's kind of something you're raising, and there is a difference. It's not that the CRPD took the ADA. It's not at all like that. Again, the ADA has three titles, the CRPD has 50. There's much more in the CRPD than is in the ADA. One of the issues um, that is very interesting that is in the CRPD that could, some people say, wreak havoc in US law, I'll share with you. And that is the issue around guardianship laws. Now, there are state laws. So again, I want to remind everyone that if we ratify a treaty, it does nothing about state law. It has no precedential jurisdictional effect on what states do. You get it? Nothing. So guardianship is a matter of state law. And I know your question, one sec. And so Article 12 of the CRPD recognizes that all people have legal capacity, which is huge. You know, legal capacity, legal personhood, the right to testify in court, the right to vote, the right to be a person under law which you're not if you have a guardian. If you're a guardian, you are not able to appear in court. You are not a person under law. Those decisions are made by the guardian. And the CRPD and the articles in the CRPD committee's uh, statement since have said that the CRPD envisions countries that have gotten rid of basically guardianship laws where someone can make all decisions for someone else. <laughs> and it's been, and I'm studying this now in all the different countries. It's really interesting how this is taking effect. In the United States, um, there are three states, Texas, Delaware, and Maryland, that have already amended their guardian laws, even though we haven't ratified the CRPD. You with me? We don't, we have, it's not ratified. But they've amended their guardianship laws to incorporate some of the provisions in the CRPD. So the most radical change in the CRPD, I think, is this idea of supported decision-making instead of guardianship. And already now, some states are adopting it, even if we haven't ratified this yet. What else? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, please. This is more of a comment to this gentleman um, here. Um, so my parents were people that you mentioned the pre-1975 didn't get to go to school. If they went to school, were beaten for not conforming to the principles. So having something like the ADA and the the Educational Individuals Act. with Disabilities Education Act. Yes, Act. that in the ADA is monumental. It's something great that we have. Um, however, um, I just feel like we might be upplaying like the fact that the ADA can do everything and that it's a great law that um, something that, you know, like this convention can't benefit. Um, because if you've ever had to go up um, and be someone who is surviving on SSDI, or even SSI, and you don't have any way to fight. For example, we've been thrown out of apartment complexes because they didn't comply with ADA. Reasonable accommodation, what does that mean? Um, so it's just kind of interesting to hear the concept of this convention, but also I think it's sort of some, it's a pent up American exceptionalism that we have, that we think that maybe something like the ADA couldn't be improved. Because even though it's great and it gives us rights, we need more. And again, again, I, I guess one theme, if I can leave you with one thought. I mean, laws are just words on paper. That people like you got jobs working in the Senate or the drafting committees or committees in the House, and right, they're words, right? So to give meaning to the words requires the advocacy and the awareness. And if there are more words kind of in the conversation and more constituents, and you can look to your friends in France or Australia or Spain or Italy, where I've studied how inclusive education works there, then we can actually give more meaning to what our words mean here. 
that it doesn't take away, but it maybe could give us other ideas. That's the way I look at it, I guess. Um, yes? I was wondering, civil rights around the world often come about through evolving social actions and forces. So what do you see as the opportunities for social movements and advocacy groups within the context of state and federal law and politics to work to support the tenets of the CRPD? So, um, I mean, huge. You, I don't know what's happening here in Michigan, I'm, and I'd like to hear maybe from you, but um, in Syracuse, New York, and New York generally, the disability advocates, self-advocates, are a huge, strong political force. Um, I know I was overseas last spring, and there was a demonstration in Congress, in the halls of Congress, I remember seeing on C-SPAN, of people with disabilities throwing themselves off of their wheelchairs to protest potential cuts in the disability benefits. Um, I think it makes a difference that people with disabilities themselves and their families and allies are standing up to try to have a place, again, at the table, a voice in Congress, um, and it's so important. And what's so, that's what's been the takeaway message. Maybe I said it too much, too many words here, but the takeaway message in my, the other countries I've heard is the power of the people with disabilities and their families and their allies, their siblings, their neighbors, who really want people to be included. And I think it can affect change. It is, no, not can, it is, that's what my next book, I'm doing a new book about how it's being implemented in different countries. It is affecting change, there's no question. Kids who, in Kenya, for example, who couldn't get to school, so didn't go to school. There's now this system of transportation to bring kids to school. <clears throat> there's a project of inclusive education, and it's so interesting, because. You know, we have a history of institutions, so we had to like deinstitutionalize and build community programs, right? Vietnam, I mean, countries, they didn't have institutions. They didn't have to go through that to get rid of institutions. They have family support system, community support system. There's a lot of stigma and fear about people with disabilities, so if you educate people that people with disabilities, what are the causes, what's going on, and can include them. So in Kenya now, there are these inclusive classes because teachers weren't learned to teach like only special ed or they were taught as teachers and now they're teaching these kids as long as they can get to the school they'll teach all kids um, so i think that's where yeah if i could ask a follow -up. yeah within legal education and practicing law what do you see as areas of need for okay. education right so that's why i'm here i don't accept every invitation but i said oh i wonder i've never been to michigan law school i mean i <clears throat> here in michigan <clears throat> state i think that um every law school should have at least someone with an expertise in disability law i mean it's inexcusable to me at this point at age if they don't okay syracuse i'm telling you, you may not know syracuse are one of the university's main signature programs is disability I came 30 years ago because they already were doing the most progressive research about community support for people with disabilities, and I was interested in that. And so we have that already. So we have many faculty throughout the university who specialize in all areas of disability. There are some law schools that don't have anyone. We have the AL I helped found the ALS law section on disability. We get good groups. Law and Society now has a disability section. I think we need, as professionals, to not just necessarily say we're going to do disability, but my question for my colleagues is how does, think about how disability could be infused to your torts class, your evidence class, your property class. I mean, there's one of my property colleagues is now this disability guy, because he's very interested in real estate development and property laws and people with disabilities and access and who controls sidewalk. So it's not necessarily you need a separate program throughout all these law schools, but how do we infuse disability in law school curriculum, which is something that I do a lot of, I was talking about, um, different, different paper, different topic. Um, and in the African region, actually, um, there's a project that Open Society supported to develop, and I've worked on this with them, a curriculum for disability for all law schools in, in, in mostly, well, it's not all countries in Africa, but a number of the countries in Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, South Africa, Ghana, Uganda, <clears throat> um, maybe I'm forgetting someone, and it's a curriculum, so people don't have to do their own work. Here it is. Here is what you can include as a course, part of a course, infused in a course, or a separate course. Here it is. Here's the curriculum. Here are the cases from around the world. Here are the issues from the CRPD. This is teaching notes on how you can teach it, and here it is. Um, and I think there's a real interest in trying to do that now. I work a lot in the Middle East, Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, to try to do something like that there. But we also need it in the United States. Anyway, I'll stop. I can go on and on. <clears throat> because I think that it's not, 
I mean, if you think about all of the courses we teach or take in law school, I mean, I did the Cleburne case. That was one of my first cases when I was a new lawyer. And I didn't argue in the Supreme Court. I brought in um, someone from Texas to argue it. <clears throat> but that's in every con law book now, right? Who knew? So anyway. Yes. I just uh, want to confirm, did the reason the US didn't partake in really the negotiations or the drafting was that of their own accord, or was it because the other countries, well, you already said you aren't going to ratify, so you can't really have a say in drafting. OK, so the way it works, so the UN, the way the um, treaty drafting process worked is there was a room with representatives right, from right. countries. OK, they're the official participants. And then there were representative civil society and organizations. Mm. And there were different topics. So you broke into different groups to help think about different articles of the CRPD. The United States Justice Departments were involved in those processes. Right. But there was a statement on the record that they would not which sign, that Bush would not sign the CRPD. Okay. And countries ignored it. They just, okay. But they